Well, welcome, Chief. I'm so glad to have you tonight. Uh, this is our part number three in a five-part series of ten of a ten-hour course, and uh, I appreciate you uh, being with us tonight. And I'm sure we don't have some more coming in. We had a, a real good attendance on this for the first two nights, and uh, uh, of course, just for the uh, matter of uh, letting everyone know, my name is Steve Carver. I'm representing the Academy of Entrepreneurs and Associates. Presentation number 1004, and moving right along. I'm not a lawyer or an accountant, but I do give free advice based on my 63 years of business. First piece of advice is always get a second or third opinion on important things that you're doing for your business. And a good place to do that is from Mr. John Hardison at Warsaw. I'll be sending most of you guys out a uh, an invitation to visit with John and fill out one of his surveys would be very important to him and could be important to you too if uh, some grants or some things come along he would be able to get in touch with you but uh, John's a great fellow he'll look forward to working with you uh, so glad to see the rest of you chiming on in here welcome everyone glad to have you on board tomorrow afternoon if there's any way possible if you're not away or traveling or at work Tomorrow afternoon from 2 to 4, we're going to be doing a, uh, a webinar on the ins and outs of DBAs, doing business as. And there's been a lot of questions about this through the year. So I put together a really good two-hour presentation talking about DBA as, uh, as the name of your business uh, and, uh, for legal purposes and also how to do business using DBAs, or I'm going to call it DBA marketing. Uh, very, very informative two hours. So if you can uh, tune into that, I, I, I think you'll be very, very pleased and get a lot of good information, just like we're going to do tonight. Uh, t next Tuesday night, we're going to talk about the best way to find and train and keep uh, the best employees. And then we'll wrap that up to, uh, next Tuesday with uh, the Dream Manager program to help you and uh, working with other people uh, learn how to dream, uh, manage and see some dreams come true, true based on your business. Uh, one of your handouts tonight is the 40 drill skills. I always encourage you to read those. And one of them is uh, this drill skill number two is, is 35. An informed and structured forecasting is the very best way to avoid what? Why do we want to be involved with forecasting? Why do we want to study it tonight? And the answer is forecasting helps you uh, dodge those uh, Murphy curveballs that are always coming along, bad luck curveballs, uh, different pitfalls of different types, unpleasant surprises, and unexpected expenses. So that's why we're talking about forecasting tonight right there. It is part five, tonight's part five and part six of the 10 part series, so we're nearing halfway, and uh, we'll move on into that. A lot of folks think about forecasting as having a crystal ball in your hand, and it is kind of that. It is kind of important that you, uh, that you are looking to the future as much as you can, but there's no magic act about what I'm teaching tonight. There's very uh, structured, it's very real, and if you think about it, uh, you'll get the picture of how important it is as we uh, look to, to planning our business, our business plan and our marketing plan, our stocking, just like we're talking, uh, just like we're, we're talking with uh, Tisha tonight about uh, different things you might be making to sell next spring, uh, to sell next summer. Uh, it takes a lot of planning to have a successful business. I don't want you to be afraid to forecast. Uh, some people just are afraid to look to the future because they're afraid to get scared or, uh, or see some things that are causing you some problems. Uh, it is, it's not impossible to know today what's going to be happening in our future at some point. It is not just a waste of time. Forecasting uh, is not, especially for entrepreneurs. Uh, what it does is uh, uh, some people say, well, forecasting is counterproductive because I'll get this in my mind and 
then I won't be as flexible to make decisions when they come along if I've already got a plan. Well, that's the purpose of planning. Uh, you, you plan now so that, to, to discourage you from making decisions that might take you away from the best part of your business. So uh, we'll talk about uh, how forecasting can do that for you. It's not a negative thing at all. Uh, looking down the road to to try to uh, think about what opportunities might be coming your way uh, is the right thing to do if you're going to be an effective manager. And I know many of us who have not owned businesses before and have had no experience in doing that. Uh, it's a uh, it's it's kind of a scary thing to worry about what's down the road when you've got your time and your money invested. And that's why we don't have this conversation tonight about forecasting. And doing what we're doing right now, having a collaboration of your ideas and my ideas and our knowledges, will indeed help you solve a lot of problems and, more importantly, help you see a lot of possible opportunities that are in front of you. So I want to encourage you, my friends, to let's get in the habit of doing really good planning and forecasting. It will lead to more sales. It will lead to more profits than anything you want to do. And it's, instead of just looking at the great big world out here, we want to bring our focus in and spot on on what actually is affecting us and our business and what opportunities and tools or raw materials or time that we have to make them work for our little business that, that we're having as entrepreneurs. Of course, we know about forecasting as far as it goes with with uh, the weather, uh, and this past weekend was a good example when it was supposed to be sunshine and all day long on Saturday, and it rained all day where I was while the weatherman was saying the sun was out. So they don't always get it right, and we won't always get it right as business folks. But the more we work at it and the more we study it, the better chances we have of being very accurate with our forecasting. Whether you're predicting lightning strikes or, or rainfall or drought, Forecasting is indeed a skill set and an art form that's important for us. So we are, what are we going to be doing? Just as Tia, uh, Tisha and I were just speaking, forecasting might be related to seasonal issues. Uh, how the weather is going to affect is one thing, but also what are people buying in different seasons that we want to have ready for them to, to buy from us? How much can we invest in preparing for that upcoming season? Will I need to hire some people to help me, or can I do it all myself? And if I'm going to do it myself, uh, am I going to need some additional training? So I'll just mention the uh, Tisha right now. We'll use you as, as a working example. And that if you have access to these carpet squares, and I know they can be very intricate uh, from what you said and take a lot of time to put into them. But you may be able to, if you see a good profit potential, get a lot of carpet squares, bring some people in that you can train to do some, some of the basic work, the foundation work uh, that, that can be done. Uh, you look over their shoulders and you, you touch them up. You, you put the finishing touches on. The objective is, is to get a large volume of material to sell with a lot less money in the per piece. And uh, you and I both don't have a certain number of hours per day. So if we can increase our volume by bringing in some people to help us and we pay them a, a reasonable low price, uh, they're going to be happy and you're going to be happy and you're moving your project along, then that's the way you do it by forecasting and planning uh, so that you can have the stock levels that you need to enjoy the turnovers, the sales, the turns, uh, to make a reasonable uh, uh, amount of money and maybe have some big ticket deposits. Uh, that, that's a good thing uh, to sell uh, 50 squares instead of one or two. Uh, but to do that, we have to plan for it to get ready. That cash flow is always important because if we're paying these people to help us, that means we got cash flow going out before it is coming in. So sometimes we actually have to make an investment uh, in order to get a return on that investment, and that takes some planning on where's that money going to come from. 
always looking at new markets and new possibilities. Uh, that's a major part of forecasting is having our radar turned on to look down the road into the future. And then let's talk about the different target groups. As I mentioned to Tisha, uh, when you're doing some decor, uh, uh, people who might buy these items that would go on the floor as decor items, as floor mats or, or, or welcome um, uh, decor type for the floor, would be people that have pets. I mean, we're in the bulldog business at the Carver House. We got Otis, our bulldog, and I don't think Norma has ever passed up anything with a bulldog painted on it since we've had him. And she's also in the cat, so she'd be interested in something with kitties painted on it. Uh, uh, folks with uh, grandchildren will uh, spend money. So targeting customer groups are, are going to be very, very important for you. And then you want your negotiating opportunities so that maybe if you're buying 20 of these items uh, for one price, you might negotiate and get, get them a whole lot less uh, uh, using the skills we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, maybe even buy 50 or 100 or 200 of them on down the road and get a really good price on them and have enough inventory that you can build up and, uh, and start having all year long to build up the next Christmas uh, with your work so that you'll have a, a, a lot to sell uh, come next fall at, at, yard, at uh, yard sales or pop-up sales, craft shows, or different holiday-type sales. Uh, buying more and learning how to negotiate will help you cut your costs way down. But for poor forecasting, no forecasting at all, just kind of riding along as we go, it's going to be hard to keep a business open. Uh, a, sustain, a sustainable business can't stay open without doing serious forecasting. So we don't want to go in out of business side at our business until we go out. But maybe the most important thing we're going to talk about tonight from the standpoint of forecasting is we're going to try to forecast and negotiating together. Because if I can teach you uh, to forecast your negotiating, teach you to plan how to negotiate, then you'll be able to steer and predict the offers in your negotiating in the future. And by being able to know how that flow is going to go, it's going to really help you win more great deals. So I want you really to pay attention, make notes if you can, and uh, learn how to feel confident and predict those offers and you'll be a much better uh, negotiator. But again, that comes back to forecasting. Forecasting is a big item as far as upselling. So upselling, of course, is when a customer buys one thing from you and you're able to say, and by the way, I've got this, and I've got that, and I've got this. In your businesses, just like in mine, we have to have a number of products. You can't just have one thing and do a lot of upselling. But you, uh, you, if you have several items, or in the case of the little carpet mats that you were speaking about, Tisha, uh, you might have a carpet mat for the dog and for the cat and for the grandchild. You might be able to have several different types and use that as an upselling tool as well, or be able to say that I can do them like this, and if you order now, you let me know when that birth date is. You can go ahead and order and pay a deposit, of course and I'll have it ready for you before that next birthday or that next time that you want to give someone a gift. That is forecasting in the future and getting paid now, but you having a, a, a lot to do uh, uh, with your time calendar so that you can plan on the work that you're doing. So sometimes you'll show samples and invite people to place orders for what they might want in the future. That's called upselling, and, and, and that, that can be forecast really as well, too. Again, it always comes back to by saying, and by the way, I've got this, but you've got to have it. You've got to plan to do it. Upselling and cross-selling only happens if you forecast the opportunity that's going to be there for you. So I want you to do that. Now, here's an example right here. Uh, I'm in the, uh, I sell implements that go behind tractors on the Internet. I've done it a long time, and I have a website. So it is the Christmas season, number one, right? People that are thinking about buying Christmas presents, 
this is the season. People that are doing tax planning, like, like farmers and industrial folks who, who uh, take tax breaks on their uh, depreciable items, this is the time of year that they think about doing that. And folks that are thinking about getting ready for next season to harvest hay and do their mowing, this is the season when they place their orders. So by me forecasting that they're going to be ordering at certain times and this is the season that they're thinking about doing that or making those decisions, it was time for me to put a full-page ad in a real important magazine for CarverEquipment.com where I listed down one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven different profit centers. All these are connected where not only will a customer maybe buy one thing, they may buy or order two or three things because they are connected. So it was time for me to get this ad out now before Thanksgiving. So this ad cost me $1,125. It's a fast line magazine. And I, I had quit, I had quit uh, advertising here about 10 years ago. I used to be in here every, every time the magazine came out. But the Internet was a better deal for me to, to advertise and get, a, to, uh, get exposure. But I, I kept reading this magazine and subscribing to it and noticed that I had five or six items that we sell a lot of, our primary sale items, that were not being advertised in this magazine. So that's what drove me to say, well, let's give it a try because these products that I'm advertising, I'll be the only person in this magazine that's advertising these particular products, which should give me a good edge against my competition. So uh, just an example, that is called forecasting, and it's called investing to make some money. You have to invest to get a return on your investment. So I've, I've put my money where my mouth is on that. We always have to be looking at our calendar. So let me encourage you, are you looking at your calendar now, thinking about, what is your next sales season? When do you think the next time for the items that you sell and offer that people will be in the market buying? And if you've already, if this is your sales season and you're not out there with advertising and marketing, then here's what you need to say: I don't, I don't need to miss another one. I need to be ready for Christmas, or I need to be ready for Valentine's. I need to be ready for uh, for April. Uh, for the springtime. I need to be ready for next summer. So think ahead so that when the season does come, you'll have products to sell. It's all about having the right product at the right time at the right price, right? Uh, it, because otherwise you've got an empty basket for what people are trying to buy. Now, forecasting also saves us a lot of money. When we think about it, it helps us look at our possible risk and how to avoid risk doing it or helping us be better with our risk management. We do that with forecasting. So I would encourage you to list down anything that you think may go wrong in your business. The different kind of things that you're doing, list down what are the biggest risks that you're going to take. List them down, one, two, three, four. Now we talked about this back in week two in our 14-hour uh, series, uh, business planning listing down your risk. Uh, and, and once you list those risks down and put them in different categories, then you can come up with the risk management tools that it will take to keep those risks from, from hurting you real bad. Now let's say that one of the risks that you have, what we probably all have, is fire. A fire can burn down any store, burn up your inventory, your car, or whatever. So what are we going to do as business people forecasting Forecasting that we may have a fire, now let's forecast what we need to do to keep that fire from hurting us too badly. Well, first of all, we want to train our employees uh, what we would do in case of a fire. We want to have some safety signs to, uh, to uh, keep our employees from, from uh, uh, getting hurt and knowing what to do in case of a fire. We want to have fire extinguishers out careful storage of different things, good housekeeping, let's be clean, uh, a sprinkler system maybe, and we want some insurance. So if 
if uh, I was playing in my business, and, I, and, and as I do, and fire is an issue with me, I would make sure I've got all these items covered to make sure that if I do have a fire, it won't hurt me too badly. We need to do that with basically every risk that we're going to talk about. And you'll enjoy when as we get into more of this tonight, okay? <clears throat> I don't know. I hadn't done this before, Steve. How am I supposed to know all that stuff? Find somebody that's been there and done that. Find someone that's been in business. Of course, I'm happy to talk with you. And having been in a lot of different businesses and helped a lot of different people in business, I can give you a lot of good free advice like your small business centers can or maybe someone that's close to you and your family or a friend. But talk to other people about the risks that you are in front of you and see how they handle them when they were in business or what their advice is. It could be very, very rewarding for you. Everything's changing. Uh, two years ago, COVID came along and turned the world upside down. Uh, now we're dealing with the uh, war over in Ukraine, which is changing everything. It's the cause of our inflation. And because that's going on, we have the politicians blaming each other for something that neither one could have done anything about with the, with the Russian situation. But still, there's always a big argument going on. Uh, those arguments lead to people. Some people stop buying. Some people take their money out of the stock market. Other people put it in. There's always a constant change. And if you get caught up in that, looking at the whole world going on and all this stuff, and people are always saying, oh, man, our world, this world is going bad. Our country is going to the pot. Things are so awful. It just mushrooms and goes on and on and on, and I will assure you, you will be forecasting that you're not going to do any business. You will be forecasting that business is going to be bad. And I will assure you that if you forecast that your business is going to be bad, it will be bad. So take it from someone that's seen eight or ten cycles in business go up and down, up and down, even in the worst of times. A lot of people are doing real good in business. I'm going to say that again. Even in the worst of times, a lot of people are doing real good in business. And what do those people that are doing real good in business have in common? They forecast the issues coming. They adjusted their business. They still made sure they had the right products at the right time at the right price, and they're doing business. The best way that you can make sure that you uh, put your hot dog business out of, out of business is to hear that there's a storm coming or to hear that it's going to rain tomorrow or hear that there's people just don't have any money and you decide to, to put your hot dog stand in the barn and not go out on the street to sell your hot dogs. When you do that, you're not going to sell any hot dogs. And the ones who do go out on the street and take that risk, knowing that they've got a good product at the right price and there will be a few people out there buying, they will get all that business and have a great day. So we have the chance now to say, I'm going to do some forecasting and negotiating, and I'll do some risk taking, but I'll do it smartly, and there's an excellent chance that you will make money when everyone else is sitting around complaining. We can do some types of forecasting every day. We can be looking at our calendar, next Tuesday, next Wednesday, next month, season to season, what's happening next time. What are our competitors doing? What do they do to, 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 to always be changing? And how can I watch them and uh, maybe change what I'm doing to, to, to earn more money? Maybe I can order in some truckload sales and, and sell stuff in large volume to get me some big ticket items. And by getting a truckload, I'll, I can negotiate for a great price. When I have those uh, truckloads, then I can do layaway plans. I let people pay a deposit and start making payments possibly. Uh, if I've got a good display with a lot of uh, uh, profit centers that are connected to each other, I'll take advantage of import buyers. Uh, but you do that, you have to plan. If you don't look after those customers and you don't need staff to help you, you're going to have to forecast that and have them in, as well as a marketing campaign 
to help you get, get that job done. So as I mentioned earlier, what is the goal of a good forecaster? You want to have the right product, the right quality and style and quantity. You want to have it ready at the right time when the market is as the highest demand. So you can get the hottest, biggest price for it that you possibly can. And you want it to have planned ahead of time and forecast so you bought it at the lowest possible price, which means you've got the biggest chance to have a spread between what it costs you and what you're going to sell it for. That margin, that potential margin, the better your forecasting is, the greater your chance is to make a higher margin on anything you sell. Okay? All that is about better risk management. That's what we're talking about. Now, as we're talking with Tisha and, and, and uh, some other folks, uh, things just don't happen overnight. It takes a lot of planning to make things happen. So marketing doesn't just start out with an ad campaign like I did. Uh, my marketing plan didn't start out to have this stuff uh, to put it on sale in November and December. First of all, I had to have a good season of forecasting or we don't have it in stock at our distributorship. Is the price going to remain about the same? How, how, how much uh, lead time will I need with my customers? And how much of this can I take orders for and plan to deliver next year? A lot of thinking and planning went into uh, this ad campaign before I wanted to spend that uh, over $1,000 in money. So it doesn't just start with an ad campaign. Let's use, for example, uh, let's use, for example, uh, the pumpkins that we seal, that we're seeing all over everywhere now at different garden centers and stores. Everybody's got a pumpkin for sale. Of course, after Halloween this week, a lot of them have been sold, but people are still using them for their uh, Thanksgiving and for their Christmas decorations. Decorations for the season, right? So a lot of them have been sold right here in eastern North Carolina. So let's think about what went into this pumpkins that we see everywhere. Because someone had to do a lot of planning a lot of forecasting and a lot of negotiating. So let's go through this kind of quickly to give you an idea for what you're thinking about doing, how it would apply to your products uh, that you're doing, or maybe what you're planning on selling, okay? The pumpkins that uh, we see on the lots right now, uh, they were displayed in, in, in early October or even September. Uh, they were harvested back in August and September, and a broker... A broker probably arranged for that harvest even back in July. So what's happening with the pumpkin today, a lot of it was happening back in July. And even before that, back in April, that field had to be fertilized and the seeds had to be planted. Back in March, someone had to till that soil and uh, bed it and make, make sure that I don't put my pumpkins here. And you know what? Even a year ago in January, the farmers were setting those fields aside. Before that, back in December of last year, the broker was probably finalizing a deal uh, on a contract on how many pumpkins someone was going to order for this year. Last year, in November and December, people were ordering pumpkins for this year. That's right. A lot of planning going on there, right? And even all the way back to September of last year, 15 months ago, September of last year, wholesalers were making their mind up on what kind of risk they were going to take related to the pumpkin crop this year. So what I'm saying to you about forecasting is just not joking. It's just something good to say. It happens every day with so many things that we buy and sell and these pumpkins we're looking at on stores today is a good example. Those pumpkins are there today because people were making plans for them September a year ago. So keep that in mind when you're looking at what, what kind of planning do I need to do in my business. So the better planning you do, 
the better the chances are that you're going to end up with some profit. The better forecasting you do, the better your chances are that it will be profitable for you. Now let's go back and look at the pumpkins again here on the slides. Now, pump, pump, selling pumpkins on a one-man show, just like I showed you, a lot of people are involved. But you, you're the person that's actually got to, got to stand out there and you're selling them. But once you do that, and when you know that you just can't do it by yourself, a lot of people are involved, you'll get better at the game. And getting better at the game equals making more money. So let's say that the pumpkin sold for $10, all right? The pumpkin sold for $10. A lot of people are going to get a little piece of that $10. Let's think about that. The broker or distributor gets a dollar. The agricultural supply people that sold ag supplies, they get 25 cents. The banker where you someone borrowed the money, he gets 10 cents of that uh, $10. The farmer and his team that actually grew them gets a dollar and a half of that $10. Someone had to drive them around the freight truck and the equipment, uh, the trucking industry, they get three cents of each pumpkin. Uh, the people who actually haul them get 20 cents per pumpkin. And the labor crews that pick them up and put them in the truck and take them out of the truck and unload them, those people doing that physical work, they get 50 cents per pumpkin. All right, so the wholesaler paid three dollars and fifty-eight cent to a lot of different people for an item that he sells for an average of ten dollars. But here's the good news: he still ends up with six dollars and forty-two cent. That's gross margin. I've got gross profit written there, but it's really gross margin. Six dollars and forty-two cent. Now remember that. Of the ten dollars, he gets six dollars and forty-two cent. So <clears throat> now let's talk about his cost of doing business. And what I'm showing you how to do here is a business model. Remember, we talked about that back in week two and in week three. Well, this is what a business model would look like if you're talking about growing items like this. Well, his general overhead cost, his general cost of doing business, is. 12%. So a dollar twenty would go towards general overhead costs. And with pumpkins, you drop a lot of them, and they spoil, and they get cracked, or they get bruised up, or they get a hole in them. So you're gonna lose about 20% of your pumpkins on average with just general regular handling. So you're gonna lose two dollars and fifty-one cent in handling and spoilage costs. Now we got to we got to put some signs up and, and market these pumpkins so people will know where to get them. You know, direction signs, putting them in the paper, uh, buying a billboard or two, buying some uh, social media. Fifty cent per pumpkin for advertising, and we're knowing that's two dollars and twenty one cents worth of cost. We've got to pay taxes to folks, so we'll have about fifty five cent in taxes. So out of our gross profit of six dollars and forty two cent what is actually left in net profit after taxes but net profit is a is a dollar sixty five wow that's a lot a lot of difference isn't it from ten dollars down to one sixty five actually being left well that's the way things work so that tells us that if we're just gonna sell ten pumpkins we're not going to make but $16.50. If we want to make a lot of money and have a big ticket deposit, we need to sell a lot of pumpkins, right? And then we can make a lot of dollars. So let's see how that plays out. All this is your business plan, doing a business model, forecasting how well this product will do. So here's where we broke it down to where we ended up with $1.65. And uh, worked out pretty well, but basically we got a 46% return on investment because our, we got to remember back our investment was three dollars and fifty-eight cent. So while a dollar sixty-five didn't sound too good comparing to ten dollars, but when you compare it to three dollars and fifty-eight cent, pretty darn good, right? All right, that's a net return on investment, 46%. Now why am I having this conversation with you? 
I'm having it so you can see the difference in forecasting and planning, how it affects your net profit. So you decided that there was 2,000 pumpkins going to be sold in, in Warsaw this, uh, this season, and that's what you planned for, 2,000 pumpkins. And they would range in price from a dollar to ten dollars, or an average of five dollars each. So if you have two thousand pumpkins for sale, you don't have to make a ten thousand dollar investment. Wow. We just got into some bucks, didn't we? Ten thousand dollar investment. Uh so business planning indicates that you should if you should uh, uh, get down investment, but that should be your return uh, on investment. If you should do that, then you should end up with $4,600 net profit because we just went through the business model. So that's kind of looking pretty good. That's not a bad, not a bad amount of net profit to make for one season and one risk on 2,000 pumpkins. Now forecasting now, the reason we're talking tonight is let me show you something. Because we went through that process, you're able to look back and determine what changes can I make in my plan to improve my situation. And it was very evident to me when I wrote this plan up pretty quickly. Spoilage. If I can reduce spoilage from 20% to 10%, if I can have my people be more careful, have better pallets, have some straw to put them on. Be conscious of not just throwing them around and bursting them up. I might have to pay a little bit more for labor or a little bit more for straw or storage. But if I can reduce that spoilage down to 10%, which is still a lot of spoilage, I will increase my profits from $4,600 to $7,200. Mm-hmm. Spend a little bit of money and make a lot more money. Spend a little bit of money after forecasting to see my profits almost double or go from $4,600 to $7,200. That is a big, big change. Keep that in mind. And when you're looking through the different things that you might be growing or selling, that this kind of thing you may apply, uh, put your little plan down. Think about it. Uh, talk to someone. What can you do here to improve your situations? Tisha, just like you mentioned something you were thinking about doing, do this all the time. Uh, Patrice, uh, glad to have you on board. Uh, think about things that you might do to improve your margins by using a, a forecasting plan like we just did. And I'll be able to. I'll be glad to help you. If you have some questions about it, give me something to work with, and we'll go through it. Now, we're going to move now from the focus on forecasting to the focus on bargaining. So let's take a ch chance, take a sip here. We're going to have some fun talking about bargaining, because that is fun. And as an entrepreneur, I want you to enjoy it. But you enjoy talking with your customers, uh, uh, talking about the prices and bargaining with them so that they feel like they're getting a really good deal. So how is the best way that you're going to bring a really good deal to the customer that's a really good deal for you? What is the secret answer to you being really good at forecasting and negotiating and bargaining? Kind of like in high school, Extreme preparation. The more we prepare, the better prepared we're going to be, and therefore the better our chances are to end up end up with a win-win situation. But it's just not be prepared like a Boy Scout. I'm talking extreme preparation, extreme pressure, going the extra mile. Forecast uh, forecasting or focus forecasting will have you to flow to think about not only the product and the pricing, but how things will flow, how the event will play out. Uh, if it's a situation where you're bidding or trying to buy something or trying to sell something, thinking in, in seriously and looking down the road, what will probably happen? 
what will people probably ask? What will they probably bid? What are their questions going to be? What concessions might they ask for? And what secret things you might have that you can bring into the bargaining? You can't just have all this stuff pop up with you because you're smart in the middle of a negotiating situation. If it's important to you, you're going to think a lot about this in advance and make a plan. The good news is, in business, we generally do the same things over and over and over again, and people will ask you the same types of questions over and over and over again. And the plan you make for something happening today will probably be a plan that you can modify just a little bit for a lot that's going to happen tomorrow. So just get in the habit of making a plan. And Patrice, I'm so glad to see you start coming up with these menus because these menus, you'll learn how to manipulate and change them around uh, to suit different people's needs, and you'll become a pro at it where it comes very, very natural to you. But the key was having that plan to start with, that menu to start with, and a list of frequently asked questions that people are going to keep asking you. That way you'll be able to, uh, to move into your plan very, very easily. So outlining. You may not have done any outlining since you were in the uh, 10th grade in high school, but it's time that we all start outlining now all the time. I outline every day my quotations, my templates, uh, uh, just like Patrice with yours, that menu of items you've got that ends up at the bottom line, that is an outline. That is a menu. That is a schedule of payments, whatever you want to call it. Have it in writing all the things that you don't need to move around or organize to close a deal. Then when you're ready to negotiate, you've got the numbers right in front of you to help you achieve your goals. All right, let's have a little fun here. Let's have a buying exercise. A buying exercise. You uh, you want to buy something. Let's say you want to buy, buy a, uh, a really nice uh, SUV, a, a Suburban. And you found a used one that's for sale, and they're offering to sell it to you for $80,000. $80,000. But the most that you can spend, the very most that you can spend is $70,000. Now, you're out in the market. You're thinking about buying this vehicle. You have thought about it, and you know that, you can, that all you can spend is seventy grand. But here's something that someone wants 80000 for it, but it's really nice, and, and are you going to make an offer on it? Well, the first thing I want to say to you is yes. If you got that close to what they're offering for, what you don't know and what isn't written down is they will negotiate probably. And who knows, they may be able to take $50,000 for it. So you don't need to back off on going after what you want because that asking price looked a little high. Just like I taught you in, in, in week four and week five, we're always going to price our items with enough room to negotiate. But in this particular situation, Patrice uh, and Tisha, uh, you've got 70000 and they're offering 80000 My question to you is, what will your counter offer be? What, what will you walk in there and offer them? And why? Well, the most that you can spend is seventy thousand. I suggest that you counter at fifty, fifty thousand, because you want them to make you a counter offer that you can raise a little bit from, and they are they are ten thousand dollars over right now. They're ten thousand dollars over what you can spend, so I'm suggesting that you. Uh, offer twenty thousand dollars less than what they're asking, or even thirty thousand, to get their attention and see how they counter. Look, they may just cry and raise cane because they're saying your offer is way too low. But listen, you're just going to say, "Well, what can you do? I've came, I've come to buy it. Uh, I can't pay the price that you've got on your advertised price, but let's talk about it." The next logical offer that they come back at you at, if you're offering 50, the next offer they probably don't come back to you at is 70. 
Yeah, they will drop ten thousand dollars if they've got room in it. They'll drop ten thousand dollars, and then that gives you room. That gives you room to counter their seventy and raise your offer ten thousand and offer them sixty thousand. You see, you're at sixty now, and they're at seventy. Uh, you've got a good range now to negotiate with them. Even there was a lot of room initially, now you've narrowed it down. The only reason it's narrowed down is because your counter offer was at fifty grand. If if you'd have countered at seventy, if you'd have countered at seventy, they would have probably come back at eighty at at, at seventy five, and you'd have been paying more. So always write it down and think about these different counter offers back and forth, how they will probably pay out. Now let's say that you're selling something. You've got something that you need to sell for eighteen thousand five hundred dollars, eighteen five. And the people have offered you sixteen thousand. Sixteen thousand. The question is, let's think about this and what will we counter? How will we approach this? What do you think? Well, they offered sixteen thousand, you want eighteen five. I suggest that you counter their sixteen thousand dollar offer. See, they didn't notice you had to have eighteen five. I suggest that you counter their offer at twenty two thousand dollars. In other words, you want to go above that sixteen thousand high enough that when they come back in between, they're gonna get closer to your number. So, if you want them to come up at least twenty five hundred dollars to your eighteen five, then you need to be thirty five hundred dollars above that. So that y'all can split the difference at about nineteen thousand. Again, the key is you thinking about it in ahead of time and offering a high enough offer that when their counter comes in, where you are in the middle here, you'll be able to find common ground and shake hands. The key here is be willing to price your uh, items very high to give you room to negotiate. It's kind of like chess moves, just playing that game. You're trying to figure out what's going to happen before it actually happens on the board. Let's talk about selling an automobile, okay? Let's talk about some other items that you may be buying or selling. Uh, let's talk about that huge selection that you want to have. Your lowest price is $13,000. The blue book average is $12,000. The blue book average is pretty much fair market value. So you're going to set the average asking price at 17000 You want your low price is 13 but you're going to price it at 17 Okay? I'm always encouraging you to price up to give you a negotiating room. When you price it at 17 that first offer is probably going to be at $11,000. How do I know that uh, uh, someone will probably offer eleven thousand because the blue book value is twelve, and people want to buy below blue book average. At least that's where they're going, they're going to start. So I can assure you that somewhere an experienced buyer will probably offer eleven grand. Well, when they do that, you're going to say, "Well, I sure can't do that, but I'll consider sixteen thousand." You see, you have come down. A thousand dollars. You're wanting them to go up. You're wanting them to go up because what you're after is thirteen. So you're gonna offer it sixteen. Now, if you're at sixteen and they were at eleven five or eleven thousand four, I'm gonna tell you that the chances are excellent that their next offer they will come, they'll come up if they want it. They're gonna come up to eleven five. They'll go up five hundred dollars on their offer. And when they do, that gives you room to say, well, you came up 500, I'll go down 500. So my offer is 15.5. 15.5. Well, when you start busting up the 11.5 and the 16.5 common ground, I'm going to say to you that there's an excellent chance that the buyer will probably offer you, if he loves your car, 
around $13,500, which is going to be a good $500 above what your low dollar was, and they may offer more. But the only reason you're getting what you wanted is because you started at 17000 The only reason you're going to be able to negotiate up to what you want is because you started at 17000 now, there's always a chance someone to come by have the cash in hand and hand it to you. Or there's a chance they just say, this is all I can do, and that's it. And they just move on. Well, hopefully that doesn't happen. But your position needs to be, I'm going to bargain, I'm going to uh, forecast and negotiate to try to get how much I need one step at a time because every time I take that step, I may get even a better offer than I had planned. All right, now let's talk about selling a house, okay? Hey, Sarita, glad to have you on board tonight. So we're going to sell some real estate property now, and your lowest sale price is $80,000. You can sell it for eighty. The tax listing value, which is fair market value, the tax listing value is $97,000. And even though you can take eighty for it, your advertised uh, uh, price, your advertised asking price is going to be $107,000. You're, you're moving the price up $27,000 to give yourself plenty of room to negotiate and hopefully maybe make a little bit more money than what your bottom, bottom dollar is. Now, I'll tell you that if you're asking one hundred and seven dollars for it, the first offer from a buyer it's probably going to be $72,000. Well, how do I know that? Because a buyer is going to try to come in below fair market value, as we've talked about all through our series. If the tax listing was $97,000, they will probably be offered $72,000, hoping to negotiate some. And if they do, then yes, you can come off your one hundred seven down to your offer can be $99,000. Well, now, if they are still in the game and they increase their offer to you up to 80000 the second offer, they've increased it by $8,000. And you can say, well, I appreciate the negotiating with you and you've come up $8,000. I'll come down $8,000 and my offer is going to be 91000 Well, if they are at eighty and you are at ninety-one. I'm going to be able to tell you right now there is an excellent chance that their next offer to you is going to be somewhere around $85,500. Around $85,500, which is well over your bottom dollar and gives you the room to take the deal or even negotiate a little further. The only reason that you're getting that 85.5 offer is probably because you started out at 107. That's called forecasting how the negotiating will go. And whether it goes faster or slower, still your chance of ending up with where you want to be needed to be based on that asking price being high enough that someone can make you a low enough offer that they feel like they've uh, uh, done themselves a favor in you as well. Okay? That's, that's forecasting how negotiation will go. All right, let's look at this one. The general tax value of a property is $158,000. You owe $80,000. And the bottom dollar, the bottom dollar on this sale price is $165,000. You recently put a new kitchen in at thirty grand, put some new shingles on the house at eight. And you added a swimming pool for $20,000. Okay? So, other houses in the neighborhood have been similar, similar houses. This is where you get your comps. Sold for 148, 168, 153, and 163. That's what comparable houses in the neighborhood sold for. Now, my question to you is, are you upside down on your property? And I know I'm going fast here, but... I want you to read these later on. Watch the uh, uh, replay if you want to. 
or let me know if you have any questions. Are you upside down on the property? What is the estimated fair market value of the property? That'll be your tax listing. So in a quiz in your handout, I'm asking you to fill in where you would put these different prices. So you don't need to do this on your own uh, because I know I'm going too fast to help you do it tonight. If we were in the classroom, we'd be doing it all together on the board. The answers are, no, you're not upside down. The fair market value on the house is 158000 uh, and you don't owe that much on it. So you'd have your advertised price. You'd figure out what the first offer would be, what the second offer would be. You'd think about what they will be offering on the first time and the second time and, and where they would start at. But the bottom line is the buyer's second offer was going to be $160,000, and yours was going to be one hundred sixty-five, dollars which would help you get right up to, to the price that you wanted uh, to begin with. So that's why it's so important to do these plans in advance. What are we what are we learning here about uh, forecasting? Always build up to a negotiated price. Uh, use common sense for the negotiator. If entrepreneurs pricing too low, then you're going to lose money. You can always come down on your price. You can't go up and always own extreme preparation as we work through these deals tonight. So that is forecasting. Planning to have an end to the forecast that will work out to you very well. Hi, Latrice. Glad to have you on board tonight. I hope you're enjoying the presentation. We're going to get ready now to move into negotiating and focus on that. The skill that I want you to think about is number 36, the drill skill. <clears throat> if you hope to be a successful negotiator, what must you do? And what you must do is be an extreme planner. Do your preparation, and your negotiations will go a whole lot better. Forecasting successful negotiation, as we just did, helps you on the preparation set target goals, introductions, seating, documents, frequently asked questions, uh, bargaining, uh, set the range for your bargaining, uh, write down, do a diagram of how these uh, offers will probably go and come, and most importantly, know what your secret weapons are, and your secret weapons in closing a deal is always going to be the value-added items that you bring. What are you bringing to the deal? A lower deposit, a, a, a better place, uh, more recent uh, repairs, uh, faster delivery, looks better, uh, easier to operate. All the things that will appeal to people that you can offer that doesn't raise your price uh, gives you an advantage with your competition. So forecasting that negotiation is impossible. I can tell you through the years that a negotiator who has a little bit of training and a lot of zeal can save at least 5% on everything you buy and up to 25 or 30% in certain situations. That same negotiator, when they're selling items, be it you or be it me, when we're selling items, we'll be able to keep 5 to 15% more of our profit because we're better negotiators. So I'm telling you, Become better, enhance your negotiating skills to earn a lot more money. <laughs> and if you do that over a period of time, that can be very important. Maybe you had never done it before, but you can be a good negotiator as well. Now, there's nine fundamentals when we're talking about negotiating. If you're at uh, uh, any business school in the world, negotiating will be part of a, the topics and everything we're talking about tonight will be part of those college lessons wherever you are in a master's program uh, uh, or a doctorate program in, in business, negotiating uh, ploys and tactics are universal. So what are the fundamentals now? They need to like you. You need to smile and be friendly. People are not going to do business with folks they don't like. 
you don't need to give up anything unless you're getting something in return. There always needs to be a balancing scale when you're negotiating. You want to have them to make the first offer. You want to have them make the first offer. That's why your your advertised price needs to be very high up so you've got plenty of room to negotiate. When they make that first offer, then you're going to stop and think and apply your planning before you come back with another offer. You're not going to make that counter offer quickly. You're going to think about how it's going to play out with three or four different counter offers coming back and forth, and that will probably drive you either being higher or lower to help your position in the negotiating. Remember, the people you're negotiating with are not your enemy. They're your negotiating partners. And when you use that line, that, that, that uh, mindset, things will go better as well. I want you to remember to have a plan B. That is, you already know where you can get a good deal. It's going to cost you X amount of money. And that's going to be the baseline for you to start your negotiating to improve your position. You already know where you can buy something at a certain price. So you've done your homework before you got there. You will always ask, is this your best price? That doesn't cost you a penny, and it's poor mouthing. I call it a poor mouthing tacket, but it will always make you some money without costing you a penny. You're, you've got an effort to find middle ground. In other words, bring the, the uh, negotiator who is up here and you're down here. Y'all need to find common ground to do a deal. Your effort is not for you to stay up here and be rigid. You set that high price so you could come down and help them come down and meet you so that you're not saying, take it or leave it. It's my way or the highway. Because when you do say that, people are headed towards the highway. I want you to learn to say yes, if, or no, but, when you're negotiating because that will keep the conversation alive. I wrote a book called Yes, If, No, But, Neg no but Negotiating. Because if you can keep the conversation going on, the negotiation open, you'll have an excellent chance of finding common ground and close the deal. Understand and work for the best terms you can and understand and, and, and uh, what the best terms may be for, the, for your uh, negotiating partner so that you can see how that you can maneuver to help them help you. I want you to understand deposits and how important they are uh, in closing a deal. Sometimes you can close a deal for a higher price by getting a deposit now. Sometimes it gives you some good negotiating room. If you're buying, maybe you can get a lower price by offering a deposit. So understand how to work deposits as you're talking. In the college books and the university books, there's basically 23 negotiating ploys and tactics. They're all in your handouts. I've, I've given you a, a good group of handouts tonight that cover a lot of ground. But we're going to get into basically all 23 of them. I don't, I'm don't. i not able to do this in our regular series, so I'm glad that all of y'all are with us tonight because it gives you a, a better picture about negotiating tactics and ploys. So let's have a little fun with them. First, again, have an alternative of plan B so that you always know what your base point is when you're starting to negotiate. Closing tactics. Number one is fletching. That's when you show a sign uh, when someone makes you an offer, a visible sign. Uh, number two is silence. That is, you're using just a closed mouth to encourage the person on the other side to make you a better offer. You're trying to get a concession without spending any money by using nonverbal communications. The flinch and the silence. Number three, good cop, bad cop. That's when you're working with a partner and both of y'all are working and you know what your script is. You'll say things that will encourage the customer to come on and buy. Your partner will say other things that might help them see a negative reason uh, that they don't want to buy from the competitor. But sometimes... Good, buy, good cop, no bad cop in selling will help you sell things. If you're on the buying side and two of you are working against the salesperson, then you would do good good and bad to try to bring them to you. One would argue one would be friendly uh, so that you try to find common ground to move along. So that's uh, negotiating, ploying, tactic. 
fate accomplished is the threat. It's the threat to uh, raise the stakes. Uh, in other words, uh, uh, I, I want to do this or I want to do that. Let's negotiate or I will do something else. Uh, this is used in military terms lots of times, like President Putin right now is talking about uh, using military weapons or doing this. If you don't do this, uh, the, 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 your fate will be, I will use something, I'll raise the stakes of the game. Therefore, it costs you more to do business later than it does now. That's fate accomplished. Divide and con conquer, the Brooklyn op uh, optician, uh, that's when you use ploys of service. Uh, to be clearly not down to the components. You look at the different pieces costing one thing, another piece costing another, and you play with those prices uh, to divide and conquer the persons that you're negotiating with. They're thinking about how much I want to pay for this piece versus that piece. Uh, you're doing, doing that to confuse the buyer. Uh, then when it's time for you to close the deal, you bring it together in what seems to be a good deal for, for both sides. Pending price increases is a huge uh, negotiating ploy, and really in times like now when it's inflationary times because we're saying every day to our customers, just like in this ad, you buy now, you save. You buy now, you save because prices continue to go up. So that is a super good uh, negotiating ploy. Number seven is called Noah's Ark, and that's when you say uh, the customer will say to you, Oh, I don't know if I want your deal or not because there's a thousand others out there. Why should I take your deal when I can go on the Internet and get 50,000 more of them from Amazon alone? So it's when the buyer says, the world is too big for me to focus on your deal. And then it's up to you as a professional negotiator to be prepared to bring that focus to you. But Noah's Ark is saying, uh, why should I focus on you when there's so many offers out there? Pay in advance, sometimes called the call girl. It's basically saying, you want this deal? You want this price? You pay me now. This is a pay me later deal. And sometimes that will move someone right into uh, uh, closing the deal. Or if they're driving hard for a, a cash price, then you would counter that with saying, all right, let's see how much you can pay me right now. So it's a good negotiating ploy to use when it's ready. When you're negotiating, it's kind of like the plumber. When he drives up to your house, he's got a, a whole truck full of tools, a, a tool belt full of things. So each one of these negotiating uh, ploys or tactics might be used in different situations. So that's, that's why you want to know about them, uh, use them from time to time, read them, and, and go through it. Now, here in a few minutes, I'll go through the most popular ones, and we'll uh, go back over those one more time. Bad publicity. That's the negotiating point when someone says to me, look here, you need to buy from me because I, I, I've got all my tractors out here are John Deere, and if I if you don't uh, sell me this John Deere uh, to go with my fleet, then I'm going to buy a Kubota, and you're going to get a whole lot of bad publicity because your, your tractors aren't as good as the Kubota. Hmm. So what it is is saying one negotiating partner is inferring to the other that if we don't do business together, then you're going to get some bad publicity, which will hurt your future business. A lot of people use that, so it's something to think about. In other words, it's either good news, let's do a deal, or you got some bad news coming. Number 10 is called the trial balloon or hypothetical offers. Uh, we'll talk uh, in depth about that in a little bit. Number 11 is an end run or a surprise bundling and upselling. Uh, on, the, on the news uh, television tonight, you can see the telephone company saying you can get this deal for $78, but we can bundle this deal, that deal, and that deal, and it won't cost you but $120. Or in other words, we can put a lot of things together and save you some money. What we're doing is the end run around that first $78 bill, because that might have been very high. I don't want you focusing on that $78 bill. That's also called the red herring, not to focus on that. But the end run is realizing we've got a problem there, and I want to run around that and bring you back to a different way of thinking so that we can close the deal on what you're doing. Bait and switch. 
used all over the world in different ways. I'll show you uh, more specific examples a little bit later. Getting their eye off the ball, we call that the red herring. Take the eye off the ball uh, and and to, and to distract someone. I don't show you all the good things about this item, but I'm not going to mention any of the bad things. I don't show you and, and stand in the way and cover up, not, not, not cheat, not fraud, but I'm going to do my very best to make sure you don't have time to focus on my weaknesses while I... Uh, points you towards my strengths. Uh, that's that's keeping the eye off the ball, and that's also called the red herring tactic in some circles. <clears throat> Number 14, it's just, okay, this negotiation is not going our way, so what are you going to do about it? I'm just going to get mad and blow up. I don't say to you folks over there trying to sell me this thing, no, 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 I can't take this pressure. You're putting too much pressure on me. I just think I'm going to quit. I don't blow up, have a nervous breakdown. Oh, no, I'm just tired of this. What you're saying to them is you don't have to make an immediate change in the way you're negotiating or I'm probably going to walk out. Well, maybe you're not planning on walking out at all, but you are negotiating and putting on this drama. So listen to me, my friends. Negotiating is a lot about drama. You're playing a role here. Uh, you're acting on the stage. And, and uh, you'll learn to monitor and handle this in such a way to help you become more and more effective at it uh, with the things that you do and say. But blowing up with a temper flare sometimes is very effective uh, with, with some people that are either selling or buying. Fake identity or authority. That's the person that negotiates with you right down to the bottom line. You think you've got a deal going on, and then here's what they say. Well, Steve, that's a pretty good deal, and I think I'd like to take that, but, you know, i just got to go back and talk to Mama about it, or i got to talk to my husband or my wife or my boss. i got to go get a higher authority to approve this. Well, that's what they said in words, but what they said between the lines was, I don't go get someone else and tell them about this, and when I come back, they're going to make an offer that's lower than what you have said. We're going to try to save some money here. That's what higher authority is all about. No one ever comes back and offers you more money. So this is important. It's, it's widely known. When you're talking with someone on, on an important deal, uh, you need to be saying to them, a large ticket item, now, do you have the authority to make this deal today? I've come here to make a deal and, and, and to sell this product. Or I've come here to, to buy this product, but I want to know if we find common ground, can we go ahead and do the deal today? The good news is, is that most people will go ahead and tell you right then, yes, yes, I've got the authority to sell it, and I'm ready to do business too. Or they might say, I appreciate it, but no, when we get to the bottom line, I don't have to get an authority from someone else to finalize the deal. So you owe it to yourself to ask those questions because if it's going to have to go to another authority to get, to get it approved, then you need to leave yourself a little bit of negotiating room at the end of the day. Because I will tell you from experience that almost never do those deals come back to someone ain't asking for a little bit more. In other words, that higher authority is trying to earn his keep or her keep by getting you to come down a little bit more on your price and uh, that's the way it goes. So when you learn that, that there's a higher authority involved, save yourself one negotiating uh, offer. <coughs> Excuse me. Excuse me. There's a lot to consider when negotiating in there. So here we go. That's what we were just talking about, number 16. That higher authority, I can't do a deal, I can't, can't good, uh, close this deal until I consult with someone else. That's what we're talking about right here. Delay and fear of deadlock. If you sense that your negotiating partner really has his back to the wall and has to close the deal right away, that would be like someone selling cucumbers or vegetables in a field today 
when it's 100 degree weather and getting ready to rain, now their back is against the wall. And because it is, their negotiating room is way down. And whoever's buying that product, their position is stronger. So if, if I was buying that product and I wanted to move them towards, go ahead and let's make it a deal now, I drop a hint that I need to delay making this decision till tomorrow or till Monday or whatever I needed to say because I know in the back of my mind they need to make the deal today. And if they sense that I'm getting ready to delay it, that improves my negotiating position a whole lot. So that give that serious consideration when you're talking with your potential customers. If And it's one reason why I'm encouraging you in your forecasting to look as far down the road as you can uh, in getting ready for the next items that you're not having seasoned. Because if you wait till the last minute, your negotiating positions will be very, very weakened. Number 18 is nibbling. Nibbling, asking for little items all along, trying to get more and more little items out of the deal. Uh, after the deal is done, I keep asking for this and that. That's called nibbling. That is a very big deal. Splitting the difference, number 19, and finding common ground. That's to breach an impasse. You've got to a place that things have stopped. Is that one person uh, indicates to the other, well, look, I'd like to do this deal, but we're going to have to find common ground here. We're going to have to find common ground. And one of the ways to do that is a term called splitting the difference. Splitting the difference is both sides shaving off a little bit, come together in Excuse me, I got the yellows come together in the middle. Splitting the difference is a game in negotiating. And it's usually used quite effectively with uh, with professionals. And if we figure out a way to split the difference, but not in the middle, we figure out a way for you to split the difference, but I raise a little bit to it. So when you're working with the splitting the difference, uh, you'll really appreciate the fact that there's several ways to go about that. And I'll be glad to show you that at a later time. Burst the bubble. That's got a new in the game now, and it's one that I've added. This isn't in the college books now, but it is in the marketplace, and I'm aware of it. But bursting the bubble is a way that a buyer sends a signal to the seller that they're really interested, but they're nowhere interested in that high price that they're offering. So they would say something like, Look here, Steve, I, I want, I, my, my customer wants to buy this piece of property from me, but, it's all, but the offer is going to be way below what you're asking, and, and we just don't want to waste our time. Uh, do, you, do you want us to send the offer in? Well, what they're doing is preparing the seller for a low-ball offer and hoping that they know it's coming so they won't surprise them or make them mad. Well, listen, a, a seasoned negotiator, it's not going to make you make me mad for you to make me a low-ball offer. Matter of fact, I want you to make me a low-ball low offer, so my answer will be, sure, send that on in here. We'll consider all offers coming in. Because as professional negotiators, we set our price up high enough to look at some low-balls. Those people don't know how high we set our price up. They're smart by making that offer and saying that, and you're smart by having room to negotiate. So it's okay for you to send that burst of bubble offer in there. When someone's got a real high price up there, you might say to them, uh, I'm, I'm very interested in that, and I'd like to talk to you about it, but you're not going to get mad at me if I make you a low offer, are you? I'm, uh, I don't want to waste my time or yours or, or for you to be uh, disappointed in me. It's okay to say that. Because if indeed you're going to be able to buy it, they're going to have to be willing to negotiate. So you're setting the stage right now for negotiating by using that ploy. It's a good thing to do. Show me the cash? Wow. If you can go into a negotiation and you've got the cash in your pocket or hand, that you can pull it out and actually show the customer the money, show them the green stuff, Saying, look here, now you want $6,000 for that tractor. 
I've got four thousand dollars right here in cash money. You can have it, or I'll carry it down the street and give it to someone else. That is powerful. That is powerful. You need to have planned that out, or as y'all were negotiating and you saw what that line's going to be, you need to be able to turn around or go out to your car and actually get that cash money, or actually go out there and sit down and write a check for what your lowball offer is going to be, and come back and show it to them. Sometimes that will move a, a deal that's almost at stalemate into one that you can go in and close as a really good deal. Show me the cash or show me the check. It's a very, very powerful ploy to use. Number 22 is the quivering quill. The quivering quill. Isn't that kind of weird? Well, think of a, a, a quill or a fishing pole that's out and somebody's biting on it. They're biting on it just like that. Okay. Well, what that is is the is the negotiations are getting really, really close, and and uh, it could go one way or the other. Per people are thinking about saying yes, and the people that sell it are thinking about saying no. But the person that's thinking about selling it is seeing that quivering quill working as if a fish is nibbling at his offer, but he wants a little bit more. He feels like his position is strong, so the quivering quill says to you. Right when you think that they're ready to make you a, a really offer, <clears throat> then you say, "Well, you know, I'm kind of thinking about, I'm kind of thinking about a, a not throwing in that trailer hitch or not making these, putting those new tires on here. I'm thinking about changing the deal. I'm thinking about changing the deal that will will, will make you have to rethink what you're going to offer me." Sometimes that customer will say, "Well, shucks, if you don't." Let's leave it like it is, and I'll go for this amount of money. They will come right away with a with an unplanned offer, the quivering quill. It's a lot like a fishing, uh, bobbing, a uh, little fish nibbling on you. So just keep that in mind. It's a pretty good ploy to uh, right, right at the end when they're, you feel like they're getting ready to make an offer that might be their final offer, and you want to up it up just a little bit. Just say, well, I'm thinking about changing this, changing this up a little bit, changing the game. And just that in itself sometimes will move someone to your position. <clears throat> the trial balloon, I told you I talked to you about, that's kind of an important step to make. And uh, and, and what the trial balloon does, uh, really important, let me back up here. That involves putting a suggestion up in the air. In other words, I'm not going to make you an offer, but I would suggest that if I were to make an offer, or if you were if you were going to do this or that, how would that work out? So that's a way of of getting uh, some drama into the game without you making a, a firm commitment as you would on an offer. A trial balloon is a way to keep the conversation alive uh, and just see what the reaction is. Oftentimes, both parties would like to see a trial balloon. And sometimes someone just don't know how to do it. And if you do, then you don't raise the positions really good. Here's the way that might work with me. I have a customer that's thinking about buying a piece of equipment, and we're going to ship it to them out in California. And if we ship it to their house, the freight bill is going to raise the price of that piece of equipment up. It's going to be $2,000 shipping it to the house. And we're negotiating now, closing the deal at $2,000. And they're really, really trying to drive me down, or, or their offers are trying to get uh, or five or $600 less than, than, than what the numbers are. So I'm talking, and I'm nice, and then I might say, you know, we've got another option here we might consider, the key word being might. If you would accept delivery at the local freight termini terminal, which is 30 miles away from your house, the freight company would give me a $300 discount, and I could lower the price down about $300. So let me just think about it. Is that something that you might want to consider? Well, there's still $100 in between there, but we're $300 closer than we were, and they don't have to uh, take their pickup and trailer over somewhere and get it picked up. But that's not a big deal for somebody. And they might just say, yeah, that's that's reasonable. And usually the words that they use will show me how that works out on paper. And I do that. 
and we close the deal. So trial balloons are very, very effective. So, uh, uh, Tisha, when you're talking with someone about maybe uh, uh, making a lot of stuff in the future, you might say, now, I might, I might be able to fix uh, 25 of these for a certain price, or uh, if, if you'd have an interest in this design or that design and, and we made it 50 of them, you know, that price might come down a little bit per, per, per uh, each one of them. Not a lot, but it could come down. But would you have an interest in maybe enlarging the order to get a better per piece price? And Sarita, this would be a big deal for you that if you're going to do some design work and things like that, uh, if someone will go ahead and do, give you a contract for a longer term, you give them a little bit of, of a break on it. But you don't want to make that offer. You just say, maybe or would you consider? Uh, uh, that way you're not saying, I'll do it for this, but would you consider this or that? Those are trial balloons and can be very, very effective. Patricia, you don't have the opportunity of talking with your travel customers about uh, whether you have a party of 10 or a party of 12 sometimes might have a, make a difference in the price or how many rooms you actually had to play. So uh, uh, when you use trial balloons and you use this because you have got the experience and you thought about this well in advance, you're actually making offers, counter offers, without making counter offers. You're just basically floating ideas, just floating ideas for them to consider. And when you see that they're focusing on one of them, it might help you a lot in closing your deal. So the 10 most active negotiating ploys now. The 10 most active. You ready? Flinching. Old Fred Sanford on Sanford and Son, the TV show, and a fellow that had the junkyard. Someone would make him an offer, and he'd go, oh, my gracious, that hurt. Oh, here comes the big one. Here comes the big one. He would actually put on a show. Well, I'm not saying that you need to do that, but just like it says on the slide here, when someone makes you an offer, you want to pretend that a mousetrap just closed on your hand, and you go, hmm, hmm. That flinch without you saying anything, grunting or crying or whatever, just making that physical movement, physical movement. Oh, my. May indeed, the next words out of your negotiating partner's mouth was, I can improve that a little bit. Well, how about if I drop $500? So use flinch. Enjoy putting some drama in your negotiating. It will go a long way for doing that. The flinch is great. Uh, it, you've hurt my feelings. Oh, my gracious, just like this fellow is doing. Show signs, show a physical sign that you didn't like what they said. But don't don't come back and fight them about it. You're just hurting the inside, but you're giving them a chance to make a concession without you having to give up anything. It's a visible reaction to any offer or concession from the other side. On your side, if you're if someone's using the flinch on you, you just ignore it and you smile and lean back and say, "You know that's the best flinch I've ever seen." All these have two sides. You might be on one side or the other of it. So you need to how to how to react. Silence number two. Just they said something to you, and you're just going to look at them and go. You're not going to say it, but like you're saying, really, that is ridiculous. You're not going to say that is ridiculous. You're just going to look and say, roll your eyes like you ladies can do so good. Do not say a word. I'm telling you. You sit there and do not say a word until they open their mouth. Because when they open their mouth, they will probably be saying, all right, what's it going to take? And then you don't say, well, you don't have to improve that a lot. You haven't given up a penny on your side, but you're getting them to come down. And my lady friends, who most of y'all tonight, be ready to use the silent treatment. You're pros at it. And to get what you want, to get a better concession price just by simply being quiet, do your lips like y'all can do so well, put your hands right up here, look at a square in the eye, or just roll your eyes until they say something that you want to hear, then you pick up negotiation and go on. Very effective negotiating tool. <clears throat> what do you say if someone's giving you the silent treatment, if you're on that side of it? 
you basically uh, you don't underestimate it. Uh, the silence can make a lot of people uh, uncomfortable. <clears throat> but you basically recognize the fact that's the best silent treatment I've ever had. Oh man, that's great. Let's let's see if we can find common ground now. Once someone is using negotiating ploys uh, and tactics on you, and you recognize it and let them know that you see what they're doing, and you recognize it, and they, then they recognize that you are a negotiator as well, things are going to go really well. When two professional negotiators identify each other as such, the chances for a good deal coming forth really improves, and pretty quickly as well, because both people will kind of lay all that aside and just bring it down and find common ground and get the deal done. Pending price increase, we mentioned earlier, that is a big deal that y'all all can use right now today in selling your products because when it's an inflationary time, prices are going up. You want the customers to go ahead and do the deal with you now so they can save money. Big, big deal. Noah's Ark is a big deal because now everyone is going to put it in your face. Well, I can do better at Amazon, or I can go on the Internet and buy this, or I can do that and I can do that. The key is that's why you needed to do this preparation because when these things come at you, you need to be ready to tell them why they don't want to do that, why they want to do business locally with an entrepreneur, with someone that can look after them, with someone that's here to stay, someone that will appreciate them on a one-on-one -on -one basis. You have to be prepared for that because you're going to see more and more of, hey, I don't need to buy it from you. I can get it on the Internet. Well, I'm one of those people on the Internet that's using it all the time, so I know it's there and true. The end run, big, big deal. You must have end run options ready for your, your, your negotiating. Just know that sometimes at the end of the day, your price isn't going to be as low as someone else's. So you need to confuse the picture by offering, and I can offer this and this and this, and by the way, this, this, and this. We can put this package together for you, and you can save a lot of money, even though you are paying that higher price for that one item. You have to plan that end run option in advance. Top number five, up, uh, uh, bundling and upselling. Uh, in, in my business, all the time, we're putting together packages of tractors and tractors and trailers and tillers and all these different type of things for a mega deal, packaging things up for a, a bundle price. I don't make as much money on each individual item, but in the long term, it is a big profit deal when you put it all together. So how can you do that with what you're selling in your business? Plan on it and put it together. Bait and switch, uh, that's very popular use. That is when, when you offer an item, you advertise it. And, but if somebody wants the, the, the better version, it, you, know, you can get the, the cheese free here uh, with this mousetrap. The cheese is free, but you've got to pay for that mousetrap. So you always have that ready. So you would advertise the picture there uh, without the, uh, the, the free on it. People think they're going to get the trap and cheese, but when it comes out to buy it, they get the cheese free, but you have to buy the mouse trap. So you figure out ways that you can use that professionally and in goodwill. Be careful with this. Well, some people will get mad at you if they feel like you hoodooed them. But we all, everybody in marketing business, just like this fell in this slide here, we, we, put those, uh, we fish with those sale tags. We fish with those items that we bring people into the store because it's important we bring them in. Remember, those profit centers, number one, we do that by baiting. And when we get them in the store, then we switch them over to trying to buy things that we make more profit at. That's bait and switch. It's not a dirty word. It's just the way business is in retail. Nibbling. It's like the little chipmunk here is nibbling away. They'll do it to you, too. How do you fight nibbling? How, how do you fight that? Because if you don't fight nibbling, they will eat up all your profits before you even get out the door. Or if you're the professional nibbler, you will learn how to close the deal and then st keep getting more stuff without having to pay more money. The key to stopping nibbling is very, very important. The key to stopping nibbling is important. 
At the end of the deal, when you're working after negotiating with your customer, you write down at the bottom of the page what the price is or what the terms are. You draw a circle around that and you initial it. Then you hand your pen to the customer and say, well, here's the deal, right? This is what we're working on. How about initial it right there? And I'll go get the paperwork drawn up or do the contract or this is our deal. And then when they come back and start nibbling on you, you say, well, yes, I can do that if we add this amount of money. Or no, sorry, I can't do that, but if we'll add this amount of money, we can do it. Yes, if, no, but, lest you save the deal after a nibbler starts trying to work on you. And professional nibblers will do it every time, every single time. Splitting the difference is finding that common ground. It's a game that's played by professionals all the time, like I mentioned earlier. Uh, finding common ground is a is a is a good term to use when you're talking about. It says that we are negotiating partners and we're not enemies because we're trying to uh, find that ground in between that we can come together. So always keep that in mind. When one party offers to split the difference, then that is a buying sign for the other side, and they need to stop trying to negotiate and start closing the deal. Start closing that deal with splitting the difference to find that common ground the best way that you can bring it together. Now, here's an example on your slide. The offer is 100 and, and, and on one side and 50 on the other. To find common ground, it would be a $75 deal. That's halfway in between. So you'll get that person at, at $100, you'll uh, you'll say and do, I'll do $75. Okay, I'll consider that as an offer and split the difference with you at, at $87.50. You see, they were at 50 You said you'd do 87 so you say, well, okay, you've moved up to 75 Well, I'll split the difference there with you between 75 and 100 and that would make the deal 87 50 And then so... Well, I don't know if I can do 87.50 or not. And then you might say, well, maybe we can split the difference because the difference in 87.50 and 100 is 93.75. The message here is that I know I'm talking fast, like splitting the difference people do, is splitting the difference on this deal doesn't mean it's going to be a $75 deal. If one person understands how splitting the difference can bump it up a little bit more one or two times to improve your profit margin. The best message I want you to take away, though, is when someone says, I'm ready to split the difference with you, if you've marked your stuff up high enough to give you a negotiating room and you've negotiated a time or two, when that message comes across, there's a good chance you've got a deal because that is a buying sign. Folks don't say that unless they're ready to make a move. Show me the cash. Just like the lady here is saying, I'll put this amount of cash on the table and you can have it or the next person down the street can. That is powerful, but that requires preparation that you've done your homework. You know where the better deal is. You know where the better deal is and you're not going to offer this person uh, as much money as you had with that uh, 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 plan B to begin with. You're always going to be negotiating down to improve your money situation. And always be willing to do that. I want to tell you that the same product in the same town at a number of different stores can have a difference in 50 or 60% in what they can sell it for. You don't know what they paid for it. You don't know how bad they want to get rid of it. Uh, you don't know what their cash situation is or their incentives. Never think that you know what somebody's price is until you start negotiating because every situation could be different. And that trial balloon test in the water in the top 10, this is number 10, always be willing to float. Think always ahead when you're going into an important negotiation. What trial balloons might I float without making a firm commitment to back it up? Always know that when you're floating a trial balloon that it needs to be one that you can take. You don't need to float an idea that you can't take, okay? You're floating that out there. You're offering bait. You're offering bait when you're testing the water uh, with a trial balloon. 
Wow, that's a lot of territory to cover, right? Negotiating is important, and forecasting with it is so, so important. So I want you to look at your study, guys, because they go deeper into all this. Uh, it is a process of deep details. Uh, it requires reading and understanding these negotiating ploys, but it will do so much for you to improve your self-confidence and give you more ability and agility when making a deal. Uh, knowing you've got all these uh, weapons or tools is a better way of saying it. Uh, to help you negotiate a better deal is, is great. Enjoy bargaining. Bargaining is fun. Do it. Fight it. Uh, uh, know the signs of deception. If, if uh, the person on the other side of the table starts fidgeting or hesitating or blinking their eyes or kind of withdrawing, uh, then maybe what they're telling you is not exactly the truth, and you need to dig into that deeper. When they start assuming ownership or tell, talking about delivery or asking questions about how it's going to use the product, they're sending you nonverbal buying signals. They might be talking, but they're not saying uh, what, they, what, what you need to hear is, I'm ready to buy when they start asking these kind of questions. What you don't want to do is to be a slowpoke when it comes to closing a deal. When they're giving you those buying signals, then I want you to have your paperwork ready, collect your signature, get your money, congratulate them on being great bargainers, and and uh, and, and do what you you got to do. Uh, uh, make sure that you say to them, "You're the best there is. I sure hope you'll let me come back, and we can I can sell you something else." In other words, they need to leave the room thinking that they were the better negotiator and got the better deal. Why? Because they will want to come back and do business with you in the future. And that's your objective. That is your objective. But after you've wrapped up the deal, just shut up and get out of there. Leave. Because buyer's remorse is real. People will change their mind. Other parties that try to talk people out of doing something or come back and start nibbling so much, they'll talk themselves out of the deal. So once you... Once you close the deal, get on out of there and do your celebrating somewhere else. Again, they're the ones that need to celebrate what a great deal they have. They don't need to see you celebrating. Otherwise, they won't want to do business with you in the future. Wow, that's a lot to talk about, and I appreciate you all hanging with me. So let's bring this thing for a, a, a landing now. Tomorrow, a lesson maybe, if not as important, more important than what we talked about tonight. And I know this is a midday deal, and a lot of you won't be able to tune in. But if you can, you do not want to miss what we're doing tomorrow. Even if you've attended all my other presentations in the past, this one is brand new. And we're going to do DBAs from all about how that affects your business legally and also how to use DBAs to do a lot more selling. Yeah, I think you'll find it to be probably maybe if not the best, one of my very best uh, presentations to teach you guys how to use doing business as to make more money. That's tomorrow at 2 o'clock, 2 to 4. The next Tuesday night, we're going to be talking about how to find and train employees and keep them, and keep them, and also how to become a dream manager, which will help you manage your dreams to see them come true, and in a work atmosphere, how to help a lot of other people do the same thing. <clears throat> uh, let's make every Every moment matter. When you're negotiating, be prepared. Uh, live your legacy out the best that you can. I want to tell you it's been a pleasure to uh, work with you all tonight and, uh, and hope that I'll see you all in the future. Uh, you're welcome, if you'd like, to turn your mics on. We'll talk about negotiating and, and uh, uh, forecasting or any other thing that you'd like to. Thank you so much. Okay. Well, this was a lot. Um, <laughs> I just have to keep, you know, going through it and keep repricing items and, you know, just continually moving forward with it. Um, just, you know, to get my feet back in there and and just keep running with it. It's a lot. <clears throat> It's a whole lot, and and I, I realize that. And but is but as you do it, taking it one step at a time, and being aware of this, um, 
uh, having these items in your tool belt, uh, even if you do, just just read them and consider it, uh, it will really, really help you when it gets down to closing deals. There's just no doubt about it. Okay. Thank you so much. I hope you get to feeling better. Yes, me too. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. All right. Sarita, you got anything to add or Patrice or St. Jane, St. Jean? It was a good class. All right. Have you had a good day? Um, yeah, I have been running around some today. I was working on um these certificates right now. Yeah, I'm I, I, I hope I hope the way I sent them to you, they're easy to read and understand. Yeah. That's good. Well, we'll be seeing you soon. I'm looking forward to uh, getting a new group to you when we finish up this series. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. All right. If anyone has anything else to add, we'd like to hear it. If not, I'm going to say good night to you. God bless you. And I hope to see you tomorrow afternoon and for next Tuesday as well. Y'all take care. All righty. Bye-bye.